Yeah, I need more. You gin. need more gin. <laughs> what? What the fuck? Now, if I say fucking Five, un, 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 just four, okay, cool. Three, two, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Toot Sweet Social Club. I'm Sean Quinn, and this is Meet Your Maker. Tonight, we're here, John Caldwell. Great to see you, buddy. Meet your maker. Meet your maker. <laughs> we were just talking about meeting our maker and how the best yeah, way to meet we your maker just might about be. That. Well, real quick, just so we get out of the way. We were just, just talking about drinking a lot of wine so you don't have to meet him too early. Too early, that's too right. Early. Yeah. And if you have wine and you need to store it, you want to make sure you use 55 Degrees Premier Wine Storage up in St. Helena. They are helping us get this show together yeah. and are, you know, allows us to, you and I, to sit here, drink some gin, talk about your wines, have a great audience. Thank you, 55 Degrees. Yeah, to the audience. So you and I have had a, a pretty good chance to talk about wines. We've sat down a few times before this, and we've really got a lot of fun things to go over. I mean, when it comes to the history of Napa Valley, when it comes to producing wines, and, and more so growing the grapes that produce wines, because that's what, when it comes to Napa Valley right iconography, you are a grape grower. grower. You are the original of original godfathers. And we've got some really great people who have heard about the show. They've got some great questions that they want to ask. We've got somebody who's chimed in and said, hey, John's on your show. I need to make sure that he knows about this. Um, and we really, I mean, I'm excited because we're in Napa and we're sitting here in Toot Sweet Social Club looking out the window. We can see your vineyard, we by the way. We can see Caldwell Vineyard. I think you're the first person we've had as a guest. That, that we can, can look out the window, the we can see your vineyard <laughs> right up on the hill across yep. the river. That's, that's pretty fantastic, and it's pretty exciting. So we're going to get right into it. And I've got a gentleman here who's a winemaker over in Sonoma. Uh, some people might know who he is, and we're really happy to have his question. So I'm going to cue him up, and we are going to get ready for his question. Yeah, hi, this is Pax Mailey. I have a question. John, you are uh, famous, or, or infamous, I should say, uh, for bringing uh, quite a few French clones into the United States. I was wondering how you feel they are um, living up to your expectations, and if you feel they're superior to the clones that were here in the States, and why. Uh, thanks a lot. Have a good one. Okay. So you've, you've uh, really done a lot to bring... Great varietals into the United States. Clones of the better varietals, yeah. They would be good for California okay. or West Coast. Um, to answer Pax's uh, question, clones, um, I was, this is like, goes back, gosh, 25 years. I'm in France and I'm trying to, I'm trying to find the best clones of Cab and Merlot and all this kind of stuff. And I'm driving around the Medoc, where we went to a few of the, like Margot and mm -hmm. this guy. And the best description of a clone is if you get your, first of all, you gotta have great toe walk. I mean, you gotta have the best piece of ground or whatever your ground is. Right, because you can go out there and find all these great vines, yeah. but if you're gonna put them in shit, you're gonna get shit. You will get shit. If you got shit, you're gonna get shit. All right, so let's assume that you've got good shit. You've got good shit. You got good shit. You got good you shit. Know, it's Maui Wowie or it's whatever it is. <laughs> and you got some good shit. All right, so now you start with your rootstock choice. It's pretty damn important. And probably one of your most important decisions, rootstock. I mean, being here in the Napa Valley and being in the United States, of course, we've all had that major phylloxera. So you're yeah, pretty limited well, into what you're going to pick. No, you're not. No, 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 no. No, but, you're not. Well, I don't want to get into that. That's a whole other That's topic. a whole other conversation. It'll be another night. It'll be another night. But yeah. we're, you're going you're yeah. gonna, to gonna pick your rootstock primarily. Based, hopefully, you're going to try to pick rootstocks that really work with your particular piece of ground. Okay. Your tail wall. There you go. Okay. It's a good way to put it. Um, the French, the Germans, the Italians have God for... Well, they started working on it in the 1870s, 80s. They pretty much solved the problem by 1900. And they figured out the rootstocks that work in a lot of different kinds of ground, okay? 
So we're, we're, we're actually in heaven here in Napa because our, our soils, our pH and all the chemistry about our soils are really pretty easy for any international rootstock to work here. Okay. We don't have the real problems like they got in Europe. Okay. So the first thing you want to do if you're going to start a, a vineyard and you want to make Petrus if you're Merlot or you want to make Latour or Lafitte if you're Cab or if you want to, you know, if you want to make a Syrah and you want to be La Chapelle, mm. you got to have a pretty fucking, you have to have a really nice, good piece of ground. You can okay. say fuck. All right. Good. <laughs> That it's gonna happen, but that helps me. It does, I'm sure. That helps me. Okay. So you start with your rootstock of choice. Try to figure out the vigor of your site. Okay. Because you you need to know how vigorous your soil is. So you do backhoe pits and all this kind of stuff. And you try to guess. And it's, and it's totally a guess. So you want to match a rootstock for your site. All right. That means also matching the spacing because uh, different rootstocks have different vigor, so you got to get your spacing down. So you want to make sure you're not planting it too wide if it's a low vigor or too narrow if it's a high vigor. That's okay. Right. Okay. You get through all this kind of thing, and your trellising is important too. I mean, uh, I mean, these are all really good things when you're setting up a vineyard and you're having to utilize different steps in the viticultural aspect of growing good grapes. Anybody who's plenty of vineyard needs to take it. These are, what I'm talking about is just what you have to do. Have to do. You have to do. Have to do. Particularly if you want to make good wine. Good wine. But I think what Pax was asking was... All right, now he, all he, the, all right. so I'm, I'm leading up to his answering his question. I'm sorry, but I had to kind of get this kind of, of stuff Of course, out of, the of way. course. Because clones are the cherry on the top of the banana split. So you got you get be, everything fucking you get everything right. <laughs> you get you get you you know you got the right banana. You got the right ice cream. You got the whole thing spread. Everything's beautiful, and that cherry that makes it a superb banana split is the clone. Is the clone. So when Pax is asking about, so he was, he's been so focused on Syrah. I can just say that the the Syrah clones that we brought in with the on top program are really good clones. There, there, there's no better clones in the world. I mean, you could, we could try some Australian selections of clones and stuff like that, but a clone now comes from one single mother vine, so it's not a selection. So you okay. come from one vine that somebody has selected, whether in Australia or the Rhone or wherever. The ones we brought in are really good. Okay. If you can't make wine packs out of these, <laughs> I mean, you can't make Pax, he's talking to you. Good, 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 good wine out of these. Um, I don't think clones are going to help you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. If, you, if you're relying on the clone. Yeah, don't, don't rely on the clone. Uh, we, we brought in good, good stuff that if you've got the right soil, the right rootstock, the right trellising, the right spacing, the right cropping levels. Oh, my God, with Syrah, the right cropping levels. You get that all right. Then my clone that I brought in, that'll help you out. Now you mentioned something really quick about what you brought the vines in through. What was the uh, the group again? Well, the the French uh, program is called Antav Inra. Antav. Antav. So let's see. Antav is abbreviation of Establishment National pour la. Propagation du la vigne. Anyway, it's it's a, it's, it's a uh, I, I'm, I don't speak a lot of good French. Okay. And INRA is there, it's kind of like, well, we don't really don't have an INRA. Maybe like USDA. Okay. Kind of like that, where it's a government agency that handles the research, the development of all these kinds of stuff. Right, because we've got a question here from Ben, who's asking something very similar to that. But I think where his question comes from is less about Enrov and how you maybe got these vines. Well, in. no, 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 Ben, no, Ben, no, Ben, no. Hey, how's it going? This is Ben from upstate New York. <laughs> My question is, I was wondering, how were you able for the first time to bring your vines into the United States? Now, Ben, I, 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 really, I really wanted to talk about my legal importation of vines. 
you know, uh, um, but I love you for asking the question. I mean, what the hell? Um, the first time I brought some clones in was in 1984. And... I brought in clones, thank God, of Cab Merlot and Cab Franc, planted them in my vineyard, and the first wines out of the clones were really good. And being Napa and being Cab oriented and Merlot and Cab Franc oriented, they became very, very popular. And that led me to want to make something even more, I mean, bring something better than just three well, I brought six clones in of three different varieties. So I approached the government of France, this is back in uh, 93, and asked them if I could license their good stuff legally so I didn't have to, you know, sneak it across the border. And that's what I was really talking about with the ONTOP program, the Syrahs that PAX is talking about. I brought in, eventually ended up, the collection is over 60 different clones from France. And they're all really good clones. So, I don't know if I answered your question. I know you wanted me to talk about my smuggling clones, but that was really only the start of the really the major program. Right, because I was going to say, there was, a, there was a few years gap there between 84 and 93 that you were bringing vines in. And, and then we're just, we're just learning about the clonal influence. This is also the time we're starting to use rootstocks. Okay. Because, uh, you know, we were only using one rootstock up to 89. Really? Yeah. Not, I mean, I used the French rootstocks, but the valley in itself was pretty much only used in AXR or St. George. Just two rootstocks, but they were really stocks focused on one. On one. And it, uh, it uh, failed. And so now we had to rethink our rootstocks. And I happened to be at there at the right, plant, right time with some... Anyway. Anyway, with... If you want to go that way. So, but you were, even before you, you set this up with France to bring in these, you were bringing in clones. I mean, you, you well, said I, you I were brought them in. I brought them in and planted them. Well, I brought them in and planted them. Right. You, you don't want to go in my story because that takes for hours. To tell well, actually, story. it's somebody that, it's not me, but somebody else apparently found out the story that you and I were talking about. Uh -huh. Um... And they have a question because they're trying to start up a secondary business. Mm -hmm. And I think what they're trying to start up might give us a little bit of insight as to what you did and maybe why you did it. Because we're really talking about... Well, now, what if it's Great Bank clones, there's no reason to do it illegally anymore. Anymore? Anymore. I mean, it's... No, because no now there, there, there's, there's... No reason. But, but back in the day, there was not. Well, we, we didn't have anything here. I mean, we were literally trying to grow first class grapes, making first-class wine. This is 30-some years ago. And we didn't have the world's first-class material here. Okay. So I so had to... you had to make sure it got in here. I mean, you have to do what you got to do. You got to do what you got to do. And on that, this guy apparently has to do what he's got to do. So I want to see what he has to do. I think I know that guy. Hi, John. It's Brent from the UK. I hope you're well. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of smuggling some organic matter from Canada to the USA, and I wondered what you felt the best methodology of doing that was. <laughs> you some bitch. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, in the in the trunk of a car. I, 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 in the I, trunk I, of a car. I guess. I get that. That's probably one of the most scientific ways. Of Bring it in back then. Back then, yeah. Back you then. just, you just, you flew it from France to Canada, uh -huh. and then it got put in the trunk of a car in Canada and driven. This is too cute. Were you really? Is he really in London? Yeah. Oh, that's too cute. He was. <laughs> in London. Oh, shit. This is great. Yeah. So go ahead. But he, I wasn't the one who gave that question away. They did. Well, anyway. Anyway. Uh, anyway. I don't recommend that, though. Particularly now with terrorism and stuff like that. But, but I hear you know, that... They, they check trunks a lot. But from the conversation that you and I had, and I'll say that we were, you know, at mm -hmm. Bounty Hunter and we were enjoying ourselves, yeah. that it's good to know the little old ladies who can wink at the... No, 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 no. We're not going to get into that. Oh. No, 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 no. I mean, that was my mule. 
<laughs> we don't want to give anybody yeah. away. No, we don't want to give no, anybody no. away. I'm, this is like international shit. There's people even in England listening to this stuff. We gotta keep that coming. All right, we'll keep it on the down. Keep it on. The I appreciate it. But, but this is really because you've worked really hard to bring in top end clones of I really did. I was varietals and really giving people the ability to have that cherry on top. And in that, though, you weren't just working with the basis, basics of Cabernet, Pinot, but you've kind of branched out a little bit and played with a lot of varietals that were not native and really trying to advance what grape growing was here in that. I mean... I got into it. I mean, I really got into it. Uh, from 84 to... 1998, so let's say 14, 15 years, I probably went to France two to two times a year okay. during those that period. And there was a real intensive period between 1992, 93, and 95 when I was putting together the package that I wanted to import legally. Now you guys, legally, okay? Um, I, I he visited every viticultural area every research station in France. Wow. No, no, I, I, did, I, did, I, my, I did my work. Yeah, I bet this. you. This, yeah. this wasn't, you know, I wasn't, you know, I was doing some serious shit here. No. And out of it was that first importation of about 43 clones that has been added now over the last uh, 10, 15 years to about 60, 65, under license, okay. right, all legal. And we are so lucky to have this in the United States because the French put millions and millions of dollars or francs into their clonal program. And now we have it right here for a few pennies per vine. You can, you can get the best clonal material in the world. It's wonderful. I mean, I mean, we, we, could, we could really be a country that's stuck growing native varietals. Well, Things like Norton. Things. Well, yeah, we could. And and I yeah. mean, and what would California wine be really if we only could grow native varietals? And if you hadn't done this work to really realize, well, no, no, we can't go that extreme. Why not? I mean, because well, we already had Cabernet here, you know, and Merlot. How did we get it here? How did we get it here? Well, that all came from France. Yeah. How did it course. get here? Well, that came, you know, in the 1800s, early 1900s. Legally. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they brought in legally back then or illegally. <laughs> I suppose they were a bunch of goddamn smugglers back then, too. They might have been. <laughs> Harasty, that guy who started, you know, Buena Vista, probably a goddamn Probably smuggler. a goddamn smuggler. Oh, son of a I mean, you, we've got three bottles of wine of yours here right now, and one of them is actually called the Smugglers. Well, that's our wine club wine, yeah. Wine club yeah, wine. Yeah, yeah. What's your wine club called? The Society of Smugglers. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? I mean, you got to play off something. I mean, you know, but it, it's, it's actually a really fun thing to play off of. Because when you think of the beverage industry and you think of the United States, especially the way the wine industry has gone in the, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and that it really got established. And then because of prohibition, it was shut down for a while. Big time. Yeah, we're a bit of smugglers at time in, in our own right. You know, we, in order well, to... Well, the whole industry kind of got a little smugly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, crime is sexy. Can you imagine an Italian in Philadelphia that couldn't have some damn vino for his dinner, for God's sake? Oh, he would have gone person. insane. He was, yeah. What do you, I mean, you, you die, right? Oh. So, yeah, that was a crazy period, and it really put a... It really screwed up the Napa Valley wine industry because we had to change varieties because we had to stay in business by shipping stuff back east. And it was a whole different ballgame that got whacked out. And so when the new industry started, like let's say in the late 60s, early 70s, what we know now as the newest industry or what we experience here today, we had to start from scratch. Wow. We didn't have plant material. You know, if it wasn't for Professor Olmo at, at Davis getting a couple of uh, mother vines of Cabernet, a couple of mother vines of Merlot, a couple of mother vines of Cab Franc, Petit, you know, he didn't, 
the petit Fredot and the Malbec, that was not even good. I mean, anyway, what we started with when we were the new development of Napa in the 70s and 80s okay. was not world class material. Right. But you've worked. And then I decided to try to, to, to push that forward. Yeah, exactly. That was my gig. Cool. I, lo I loved it. I, thought, I just loved doing it. But So you don't just grow grapes at this point. You also make wine. Yeah, we make a little bit of vino. And you've, you and I have talked a little bit at times about the way that wine styles have gone in Napa yeah. over the last Ooh. 30 years. And we've yeah, had, they've gone. They, they've gone. Ooh. And we've yeah, got a gentleman nice. right here, and you know I'm totally setting him up and putting him on a, on a golf tee. So here he is, Carl. And he's got a really interesting question about wine and how you feel it should be made. Hi, John. This is Carl Tiedemann of Tiedemann Wines in the frozen tundra of Elkhart, Indiana. <laughs> We're uh, about 12 degrees oh, here Carl. today, up from about two, a minus two. Oh. My question is, what is your general winemaking philosophy and what are you trying to achieve with your wines? That, so that, that one I can answer. Yeah, because we've talked a lot about bringing in varietals for grape growing. Right. But we want to kind of switch um, gears here and talk about wine making and what you want to put out to people to enjoy. So the, the, the one thing that you got, I don't know if you're in the wine business, Carl, or if you wanted to grow grapes or whatever in Indiana. Your, your piece of ground is your defining, I mean, that is who you are. Wherever you plant those grapes, that's who you are. That's what your wine is going to be. You can't, you can't change it. It just is what it is. Um, for me, my, my, uh, uh, my life is going to be dedicated to try that little vineyard that we can see from that this we can room, see, yep. To try to express the terroir, what whatever that terroir is, I mean, whatever it gives to the grapes that we make wine out of, I want to maximize that. I mean, that's that's that is right now in my life. That's that's my thing, and that takes. Unfortunately, we only get one shot a year for experimentation. One harvest a year, so you don't move fast on this program. But that's what I'm, I'm doing. By the time I check in, hopefully 20 or 30 years from now, uh, I'll have a pretty good handle on what works on my piece of ground. Now tonight, I brought some varieties that we don't normally even talk about in Napa. These are some fun varieties we have here. And, and man, we're making some really great wines out of it. So I have no clue. If, if we have the same thing five years from now, I might talk totally different about what might be the best variety for my piece of ground. Well, five years from now, we might have it later in the year. Who knows? If well, Didier and Susan that. have anything to say about it, well, you and I will be having this conversation again. I have, yeah, this, question, might, I have this question here from a Sean from uh, Short Hills in New, uh, New Jersey. And uh, um, talking about, you know, uh, your, your, your winemaking, um, there was a film Melka. Melka. And then now a, there is a, a Marbu Marquis. Marbu Marquet, yes. Marbu Marquet. Yes, a very famous and, winemaker and, uh, from let's Sierra Leone, and, fucking Africa. What, 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 <laughs> what, 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 what are the differences from when you started it back then with Philip oh, to what it God. is now? In, oh, in, in, in uh, two, just uh, uh, pick up uh, uh, two, uh, two major differences. All right, okay. Okay, so... So, yeah. um, so you had Philippe Malka, and now start, you uh, start, start started with Philippe. With Philippe. And yep. who's your new one? Marbu Mark. Marbu Mark. M-A-R-B-U-E. Okay. M-A-R-K-E, Marbu Mark. It's not a, uh, like a Napa Valley name. Um, he's from Sierra Leone, Africa. Wow. He's got a really good tan. I mean, he stands out. <laughs> he, he doesn't have to go to Hawaii, even though he's in fucking Hawaii right so, now. So if he's in months. the vineyard doing pruning, or if he's, you know, doing, you know, uh, shoot thinning, he's... He stands out. He stands oh, out. Oh, yeah, he stands out. Um... The question. What separates the two winemakers? So it really, Philippe actually, interesting enough, and okay. Marbu is not much different than Philippe. I mean, mm -hmm. we, the, the whole industry changed 
started to change in the early 90s with um, Helen Turley, you know, Tony Soder, guys that were really thinking about making wines that were drinkable young, that, that it showed well within three, four, five years. This right? is something you and I yeah, spoke at length about. about. Yeah, yeah. We, we talked about that. Because before that, everybody was talking about wines at age. All right, so you want to age your wine. Well, that's really nice. So here you are, my age, 70, and you go, well, I'm gonna buy this wine, I'm gonna age that some bitch till it's ready to drink, 90, right? I'll be 90 years old. Well, that's really not so cool. Why don't you make a wine that you can drink in three or four or five years? So Helen was probably one of the first to really kind of make a wine. You start with the idea of picking it very ripe. You're looking at pH or whatever, and acid levels and all that kind of stuff. But the way you make it, you, we become very delicate, you know, with the cold soaking and all this kind of stuff. You're, you're making wines that people now can drink at a very young age. And that is the revolution. Now, Philippe was part of that revolution. So I, did, I haven't changed a lot. Philippe started me picking very, very ripe. And it's turned into which basically every, what everybody does now. I mean, we, and I just got back from a trip in Italy. You know, everybody that I went to, been, went to Ornolaia and Frescobaldi is one of his top vineyards. Ended up with Angelo Gaia. I mean, everybody is picking to make wines that are soft and delicious in the mouth. Right. Instead of having to wait 15, 20 years to drink the damn thing. So that is really the, rev the evolution or revolution that has happened since I've been in the business. Just in 30 some years. Oh wow. Big time. I mean, it's, it's huge, it's huge. And we're drinking Tanat here tonight. We haven't got into the wines I brought. Oh, we've got plenty of time to go into the wines, but you actually, what you just hit on with Helen Turley and picking, this is time for us to bring up your friend Denise. Because it's, she says, thank you, Denise, for contributing. Hey, Caldwell. Is she there? Is she there? I, I think she's here. It's oh, she's there. the girl. I like how she puts the that. Girl on the, the girl on the hill. The girl on the hill. She's adorable. And, and she's, she's passionate about making good wine. Okay, give her some love. Rebecca. Give her yeah. some love right there. There give she is. Look, look into her eyes. Look give into her eyes. <laughs> and she wants you to explain what you mean by pick it ugly. This trick worked for her um, on their Malbec Triple A rating and earned them 99 points. Man, that's that's pretty good. That's pretty. So, but you were um, talking uh, about how Helen Turley and Philippe were talking about letting it well, hang. Yeah. What does pick it ugly is, mean? So, so Denise, you know what that means. It means when you went out of the vineyard and you looked at your Malbec at 25, 26 bricks, and it was beautiful little berries, and it looked really kind of nice, and, and you tasted the fruit, and it was, it was okay, and so you would pick it, and then you'd make the wine out of it, and it was this kind of harsh tannins, a little bit of too much acid, the tannins didn't work, the tannins didn't work with the acid, um, and the wine was okay, but, but just okay. And I think what she's talking about was she decided to leave it till it got ugly. Oh, okay. Ugly. Ugly. Uh, um, uh, what kind of ugly are we talking about? Well, right we're now? talking ugly. Um, you get all dimply and it starts shrinking a little bit. Uh, you lose a lot of weight in the vineyard, but the bricks go sky high and you don't even worry about the bricks. You're, you're not even sure. worried about sugar at this point. You're not worried about sugars. You got to get the flavors. It's all about flavor. Get the tannins. So it's not about looks, it's about what you can get out of it. That's We're talking about that's Lindsay Lohan's type fruit here. Hey, you got it. Oh, that's... that's it. And so Denise is asking me this question because, you know, I told her to pick it when it was ugly. Okay. And she made good wine out of it. What the hell? She made good wine. And that's, that is, pretty much what we're all about in Napa right now. And we have the luxury of waiting till we want to pick. Okay. The rest of the world, only in certain years, has the luxury of picking when they, when want, they to want to. When they want to. Sometimes they're basically told, you pick this shit now. Well, no, no, the weather tells That's you. That's what I mean. Yeah, they're yeah, basically, yeah, they yeah, look yeah, at their yeah, weather yeah, charts yeah. and they're like, if you don't you're pick done. this shit now, you're done. You're done. 
so we are we are in heaven here. I mean, growing grapes in Napa Valley, making wine here is as close as you can get to heaven. We're cool. It's very cool. It is very cool. <laughs> and we've got some going back. We've got some fun wines that we're drinking right now. So I, again, I brought these just because. I mean, we are God's gift to Cabernet in Napa. There's no question. We're going to make the best Cabernet. You know, I know Lafitte, Latour, Margot, they're all more expensive than ours, but I'll bet you in my lifetime, ours will be more expensive than theirs because our wines are better. But saying that, these varieties like Tanat, Petit Verdot, uh, Carmenere, these have great potential in Napa because of our climate, our weather, our soils. Yeah. So I wanted you to drink those tonight. No, we've been drinking the Tanat, and I got. I mean, to... that, that's a mother grabber. It's isn't a it? mother. I mean, that fucker. thing is. In France, you can't drink it. You can't. <laughs> is that okay? You yeah. can't drink. You can't drink a Tanat in France. You can't drink. It's gonna rip the enamel oh, off your you, teeth. You don't even want to. You don't even want to go there. No, I mean, I first experienced Tanat because, as you and I have talked about, I started making wine back in Virginia. And we grew some Tanat. And what was it like? It was fun, actually. It was good. It was good. It was, it was fun. I mean, was you're fun. working with a completely different climate. You know, Virginia is often... What bricks, what bricks did you pick it up? Uh, we tend to pick it about 24, 25. Oof. But the thing was... I'm surprised was, you made wine you could drink. Yeah, well, the thing was, we beat the piss out of it, too. Okay, okay, okay. So we broke it down. Okay. We were mean to it. Okay, good. We basically pulverized it. But the thing was, that helped soften it. We hit it with yeah, a lot of different yeah, things. Yeah. And it still held on to its varietal character. But Virginia, like we were talking about with France, you don't have very many years when you get to determine no, when you pick. God, so we're oh, sitting there looking at weather coming across the United States, and we're like, holy shit, if we don't pick this fruit now, it's just going to get soaked, and then it's going to deal with a whole bunch of other things. So right. it tastes good. It's got good sugar. We're going to pick it right now. And we're going to find other creative ways to really express it so that it is fun. And it was and drinkable. We, and it was great. We had a lot of fun so, with it. I mean, the so, winemaker I learned from did a lot of great things with Tanat. A lot of great things. But you've also got two other varietals here that I think are really unique. Because we've got Petit Verdot and mm -hmm. we've got Carmenier. Carmenier, yeah. Both Bordeaux varietals. Mm -hmm. One a little bit more well-known than the other one. Some have said that Carmenier is the... the um, the sixth, the forgotten Bordeaux Verdot. Exactly, the sixth, yep. Um, and most people look at Petit Verdot, and if they see more than three, four, or five percent of Petit Verdot in a blend, they're kind of curious about that because it's something that, you know, it maybe has been misunderstood. It's about adding color or adding this or adding that. Mm -hmm. But you've got these two wines <clears throat> on their own. Well, if you have a site like our site and you can let them hang, both of these are incredibly late ripeners. The Carmen is even ripens later than Petit Verdot. So see what happened in Bordeaux with Carmen was they couldn't get the darn thing right. So they switched to Merlot. They used to have, you know, uh, Carmen used to be a very significant variety in Bordeaux. Wow. Before, before Phylloxera, before the 1860s, 70s. It was a, but after that, they decided to plant Merlot because they could get it right. Um, but when you, if you get it right, it's a kill, I mean, it's a killer one. We had a couple of barrels a couple of years ago that I, it was so good, we decided to come out with what we call our platinum. We got a gold and the silver, you know, the Cabernet is our gold, silver is our blend. But that one was so damn good, we made a separate bottling, and we called it platinum. Oh and wow! So we're keeping that going. It takes it takes a special wine to do it. But anyway, um, the Carmenere is killer. I mean, this particular that I'm drinking right now is pretty ballsy. So that we pick usually in November. It's usually the Carmenere and Petit Verdot, the last things we pick just before it starts to rain, well, you know this is it. Your vines have already decided, you know, they've given up the They've leaves. given up the ghost, the leaves are yeah. gone, they're just, just fruit. They're crying, they're saying, boss, take it off. I don't have any more. And so we take it off. Um, we never worry about bricks. Uh, it could be any bricks level. It could be 27, 28, 29. But you need to get it fully ripe to get the tannins balanced out. That's the deal. We're different than France and Italy. Our tannins need so much more ripeness to get 
softness. Okay. And I don't know why, but that's part of our gig. So we have to deal with the high alcohols. We have to deal with the high sugars and alcohols. Just the way it is. Here it, we you know, part of our temperature and our part heat of, and then it's part of our soil. Yeah, it's we just, are here. If you're gonna you know, if you're gonna be who you are, you might as well own who you are. Yeah, yeah, I mean you gotta yeah, I mean, you deal with it. And... Well, oh. I think there is like a comment here and a question for you at some time. Um, when you were talking about Tenet, and, uh, and the question is from Bill from uh, Buffalo, and uh, do you mean that your Tenet is better than uh, uh, it is in France because there is more sugar? Ah, I can tell you for sure. <laughs> You can drink ours on release, but I can tell you, uh, we don't pick our Tanat until it's probably 20% riper than they normally can ripen it in France. And that's the problem. Um, I don't know if you know anything about winemaking, but the pH of Tanat at 25, 26 bricks is so low that the acid will take the enamel right off your teeth. And that's why Tanat is such a long, they have to age it to soften those darn tannins and acid. Anyway, yes, mine is better. <laughs> it's even, even better than ones in South America. Well, I've never tasted the, the uh, Ur I mean, I've never been down to Uruguay to, to taste them. Well, um, I, I, I would assume they probably figured it out too. If they got the sun, you want to pick them super duper right. So I mean, over the, over the top, right? Over the top. They're just, ugly. Just blow your... Just as, pick it, as pick Denise ugly, saying, as Denise would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. You Sounds like we have, a, we have a question from the audience. You gotta come up. Okay. You gotta come and, up. And, and yeah, very quickly, right. I have a one yeah. to you. Yeah. Come you know, and, uh, and another uh, from beer from follow and uh, how much is your, your tenant? How much is it? Yeah. 95. 95. No, no, right here, Rich. Oh. Oh, Rich, what the hell? What oh, the well, hell? Did you do that so well, did I? <laughs> okay, so, so, um, so this is like good for like cleaning your teeth to not. Um, this one, no, you don't need to. This one doesn't have that pH. Okay. It's drinkable. So, you, did so, you try it? Yeah, yeah, I'm working on it. Thanks. Okay, cool, cool. So, um, chemistry at bottling, mm. what's the pH there? Well, now you, you know what sugar is? 32. Okay. pH 36. 36. Oh, my. But so it was a lot more, so it was, a, it was a lot of acid going into the barrel. Oh, God. If you picked it, well, what do you want? What do you, what do you mean? So I was trying to figure so out. So after, after, after Mallow, it's probably around 37, yeah. 38, something like that. Okay. And so it hits your mouth with all this acid. Right. And, and those harsh tannins of. Madi Ram, I mean, yeah. in the south of France, and that, 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 yeah. and it's just... There comes Didier! There comes Didier! So, for us, kind of like amateur chemists, these numbers are confusing. So, oh, like, it's the it's, lower it's, numbers or the stronger acids? Lower numbers are stronger. Stronger acids. Okay, yeah. so, three, eight, three, six. That's, 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 that's where your mouth, where you want, that's where where your mouth want. goes, oh, this is, this is, this this is, is gentle. Nice. Yeah, this yeah, is nice. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's, yeah. A, that's, that's a softened... Exactly. That's nice. Okay, cool. Good. Thank you. Cheers, Rick. And actually, this brings us, because we're talking about all these really fun varietals, to our next question. And we've got here from Stephanie. And talking about the fact that you are playing with Tanat and Petit Verdot and Carmenere. And here's, you know, you've brought in a lot of varietals from all over the place. A lot of clones. A lot of clones. Well, here we got from Stephanie. I'm Stephanie from Pleasant Hill, and I'm curious, what's the craziest varietal you've ever worked with? Craziest? Yeah. Craziest, Steph? Um, Tanat. Tanat is crazy. I mean, it is. When you think about picking a, a wine grape at 32 bricks, I don't know if you know anything about winemaking, but anyway, but that's a lot of sugar. And if you were to convert that to alcohol, you would end up with 17 or so percent alcohol, okay? And that is kind of what we end up with. <laughs> um, that's wacko stuff. That's like port. But that's, for us, that's where we have to get it ripe. 
that brightness to make a wine that's enjoyable to drink uh, at an early, early age. I mean, in other words, you don't have to wait 20 years to drink the darn stuff. So I don't know if that answers your question, but Tanat is wacko. Is wacko. It's absolutely it's wacko. wacko. So we're drinking the Carmenere? Carmenere. Yeah. And All right, so. It's, I was going to save a little bit of my Petit Verdot. What vintage is that? Mm. Good question. What vintage are the wines that we're drinking? Real you know, I don't we're just drinking wine. I don't even know what the hell we're drinking here, but I, I, I know they're... 2011 on the Carmenere, okay. by the way. Yeah, I, I, I age my wines, you know, well, 2011. <laughs> <laughs> but this stuff flies out of the tasting room. I mean, they, 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 people love it, so... And I've only got six and eight bottles of the rest of the vintages. I mean, they, they, they beg me for it, so... And it's hard when a good-looking girl is going, can I have a bottle, you know? Oh, and my you know, gosh. Okay. So we're down really less than a case on a lot of this stuff. Lots of, wow, and you're just moving through. And you sell, I mean, when we were here talking with Adam and with Julianne, and you do still yeah. spend a fair amount of time on the road, but you sell a lot more wine. No, well, now I really... Out of the winery. I, I really, I really smell 90% 90, 90 out of the winery. 90% out of the winery. Yeah, the people come for tastings and we... You know, I sit down, my little cowboy hat on, and, uh, you know, two hours, and we in, enjoy life. Enjoy life. We enjoy life. Talk I mean, about if whatever we can see your about. vineyard from here, then the view back oh, yeah, from they can, your vineyard. They can see you. I mean, they can see that darn... That water tower that that's water back tower. there. Yeah, <laughs> you can see that from our vineyard. It's a terrible, terrible view that you must have. I mean, you can you... Can, here's a question. Can you see... San Francisco, from where you, like on a clear night, are you high enough up? There's one hill that, or if that wasn't there, I could see San Francisco. There's one hill, that's, man, yeah. that's, yeah, that's pretty, pretty fantastic. Well, we've got another question. One more question from, from other audiences right here. Boris, oh boy, what is Boris gonna ask us? I'm curious. Hi, right, Boris, here we go. Hey, hi, John. Uh, it's Boris from France. I've got a question for you. So I, uh, I think you don't put the uh, Coombsville appellation on your label. I may be wrong, but if that's the case, can you tell us why? Thanks. Hey, hi, John. Uh, so, apparently, <laughs> Boris says you don't put the Coombsville appellation on your uh, label. Boris, now, now, we, now we definitely do. In fact, because I can see it right yeah, here. That yeah, we, we have to, Well, now that we're an appellation. Okay, we're an appellation. Um, we're supposed to put it on the label, so yes, we do. Um, but the Coombsville Appalachian is only about two years old, three years yeah. old? Yeah, two, two years old, two, hey? Two years yeah, old. Two. We're only about two years old as an official AVA Appalachian. So you yeah. just, so anything pretty much made before 2000. Oh, well, we, we didn't have, we couldn't say Coombsville. You couldn't. No. So, couldn't, so, so maybe yeah. certain wines that are in the market right now, or yeah, they wouldn't if they were produced before 2011. So they're 2011, not going to say 11. Right. Yeah. Right. So, but like your 2011 coming year that we're drinking right now it's got it. says, oh wait, let's do a bottle shot. Ooh, stream close up. Put it back down. It's easier. Thank you. <laughs> that one says. Coombsville Aviate. It says Coombsville Aviate. There we go. Yep. I mean, come on. It's the best AV. It's the, it's when there was a writer there a few years ago and I said, he was out with my vineyard looking up through Coombsville and I said, this is the next Rutherford bench. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, I think so. Come on. It's oh, be, good. I think it's going to be as good or better than Rutherford Bench when we get our shit together and all of us learn how to make wine out there. But we're going to have a great time. Talk about the terroir up there. How different it is from Yeah, how different? Uh, no, no, that's a really good question. Oh, look at that. That's yeah, a now really, really, really who, who are you? You're a neighbor. You know, we sneak who, around every once in a while. Who are you? <laughs> I'm his neighbor, Gail. Um, that's, that's we've taken camera. a long. Yeah. We've give, taken give that a, camera love right this there. One, this one. Right in the middle. This one. Oh, that one. Oh, oh that one is Gail's camera. That's for her. Oh. 
I was giving love to John. Oh, all the... Yeah, I always do that. It's taken us a long time to get our Coonsville ABA. We've worked really hard mm -hmm. at it. We've got a, a, quite a ways to go yet. Uh, only by putting it out there and presenting it and telling how great our terroir is. We already had great wines out there, thanks to uh, John. Uh, he's the one that be very grateful for him. So uh, maybe, John, if you could explain the difference between our terroir here and Coonsville AVA compared to all the other all ones the other. in Napa. Mm -hmm. Could you do that? Because I, I feel it's very unique. It is area. very, very unique. And I think it shows in these wines and everything that you produce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, so that's and where you and I are is... Yes, I am. Well, it's the best. Can we see, the best. By the way, can we see your house? From here? We're on the almost. north side, almost. Yeah. almost he looks yeah. right, we're right neighbors. We're on yeah. the north side. Right, right on Coombsville, Green Valley Road. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and it's, it's a really great question because as Napa matures and as it develops, we're really expanding on how it grows grapes and how people, as they become more educated, understand Napa. When they think of Calistoga, St. Helena, you know, how Rutherford, different it Oakville, is how different it is, the what the place. soil that we get to work with, the yep. small microclimates. Yep. Coombsville is something special. Coombsville as an AVA is definitely something special. And um, it, it is the half circle of a caldera okay. that was, who knows how many millions of years ago, literally a huge caldera, about a something that was about five miles in diameter. And where are, I'm sitting on the southern end, the southern ridge of that caldera, southern ridge of the caldera. Uh, the northern ridge is where Palmas is, you know, that, okay. that area. Yep. Okay. And in between is an in incredible amount of different soil types because it's all alluvial. It fills it up over the millions of years, you know. So, but it is, what makes it kind of, I think more unique than any other place is the fact that it's just one half circle that is so close to the bay. We wake up earlier than any, well, we wake up the same time as Corneros. So we're waking right, up. Right, because there's no mountain range blocking right. the sun we're, from we're, coming we're, up. We're, we're, we're waking up, our plants start pushing about the same time as they push in Corneros. So we're talking about an early March push almost every year. But we don't, because we're so close to the bay and the influence of the ocean, that we don't pick until November, almost every year. Wow. Last year was unusual. We, we got, I think we picked out by October 25th or 26th, but that was a whole, almost two weeks earlier than normal. Um, it's a really, that, that weather pattern really makes us unique. For reds, if hang time means anything, we got the longest hang time in the valley. Really? I, uh, You're home. Yeah. Calistoga's still sleeping when we're already, you know, we're this much growth. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about hang time and growth. It's... Yeah. Uh, I love everything about hanging. Hang. Uh, <laughs> you want to hang John, me? John B. from Chicago has a question for me yeah. uh, uh, regarding that, actually. Um, uh, the Appalachian, you know, since the Appalachian occurred, um, and being that, you know, you've been a very uh, a pioneer of that region, you know, have you seen yourself a different type of traffic, more food traffic coming up through your door and, uh, and uh, better uh, uh, sales, direct sales, you know? Uh, uh, because of the appellation. Because of the appellation of recognition. Um, appellation gives you credibility. It doesn't really... You know, it, 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 nobody's going to go to... It doesn't make you want any better. No. And, and it doesn't make anybody want to come to you because you are Coombsville. It's like, it's almost like if you go to France, if you go to the Madoc, you got Pouliac, you got Margot, you got saint Estep, and you don't go there because of the Appalachian. It is... I've been surprised at how much news media, uh, the news media has jumped on the fact that we're the newest Appalachian. In fact, it's kind of made me feel pretty good because I was kind of part of the whole thing. Um, but it, when it comes down to sales, nah, I mean, it doesn't mean anything, but it's just, 
kind of cool to have an Appalachian on your left. The fact that you get to put more than just Napa exactly. Valley, you get to put we are We are Coombsville. Emil, Hi. one more question. What do we got? Another question regarding the mm -hmm. Carbon A is about how many acres would you say was planted in Napa Valley? Of Carbon A? Yes. Ah! <laughs> Are you leading me on here? Well, no. That's I am the largest grower. Okay, uh, you're the largest grower. About how many plants or acres would you have? Uh, two and a half acres. Two and a half. Okay. <laughs> a thousand plants then. No, so. I, got, I got about, uh, total I have about uh, 3,000 lines, something like that. Okay. 4,000 yeah. lines. The next question is the carmine about what root stock is the carmine performing the best on for you? If you well, you know, different car since, since we really don't have to worry about rootstocks. Right. Okay, I thought, I thought 30 years ago when, when rootstocks became a big deal, I thought it was really important to learn which one might be the best for your... But say if you're dry farm. farming it and you're not getting... Well, now, if you're dry farming, that's a whole different bucket. Yeah, if you're but dry farming... I, I don't dry farm. Okay. I have, I have yeah. irrigation, okay. so... so... But say if you're a... a a young person and you're going in and you wanted to dry farm. Dry farm? In. Oh, now we have to talk because yeah. that's a whole different ballgame. Okay. But if you're down in nice alluvial soil on the valley got, floor. Yeah. And, uh, if you, then you don't have to, you know, you don't have to worry too much about rootstocks. But if you're really dry farming like where I am, right. you got to really okay. plan on the right rootstock. Okay. And you'd have to go to, you'd have to go to the rootstocks I use like in the southern France. Okay. Where you know down the Languedoc, Roussillon, where there's no hardly any rainfall in the summertime, they have sort of worked it out. There's about three or four rootstocks that work that will okay. tough it out, give you two ton, three ton to the acre. Right. 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 Okay. And I would go to those. Oh, one ten, eleven oh three. One ten R. And how about Paulson? Pauls, absolutely Paulson. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. One forty region. It seems to ripen up a little earlier. The Paulson. Well, it's, it's 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 a rootstock that no Paulson doesn't ripen any earlier. No, no. Oh, okay. Your pesticides are not really early like ripeners. We're just gonna, we're just gonna drink wine. We can talk about this for for hours. Yeah, but yeah, but but yeah. If you wanted to dry farm, you, you'd go to those kind of. Okay. Arr, right. Oh, right. Arr. we got pirate. Saint George yeah. would be a good one. Right. The old Saint George. Now, no, what can are compared to Saint George? I, I, if I was if I was gonna dry farm, right, I'd do the same thing the old Italians did. I plant St. George. St. George. There you okay. go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They've proved themselves over the years. They've proved it. They, they know. That's, Come on. That's really they good to know it. because there are so many people out there who yeah. are thinking about moving mm -hmm. forward like that. And if they want to take an old school approach and they really want to move forward, thank you, Mitt. Go with, go with experience. Go with experience. It's, exactly. it's a really good thing. And you've provided a lot of experience. And you've got more experience to share to the point where you and I... We've sat down together three different times now, and we've talked for hours, and all of a sudden we look at the clock, and who knows how long it is. And if anybody actually wants, out there, wants to come and share some more experience with you, kind of visit you at your winery, when can they do so? How would they find you? You know, hit Google. Hit Google? Call, <laughs> hit Caldwell Vineyard. Caldwell Vineyard. Um, if you go to, it's so cute, if you go to Google Earth, yeah. and on our label, we've got our, uh, our... Uh, do you have your... Yeah, yeah, we got it on the label. Yeah, you do. And so you hit that, and boy, it goes, ooh, <laughs> and there's fucking Cobble. And your vineyard shows up, too. That pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there. I know it is. So you can it's find right John's Vineyard <laughs> on Google Earth. You can type in Caldwell Vineyards. Yeah, and I mean, and then and then call the office. Call my. I mean, they're, are you by appointment only? By appointment. You're we, by we appointment only. We only do four tastings a day. Four so tastings a day. You get two hours of me. I mean, if you want. Wow. Two hours. How much does it cost for two hours of your time? Ah, shit! You got to buy some vino to make me feel good. But other oh, than that, you, make you feel all, good. Yeah, make me feel good. We'll make buy you feel some good. vino. Yeah, yeah that's all. Whatever it takes. you like. Yeah. Very cool. Whatever you like. John. It was, it was great. Pleasure. It was fun. It was it's fun. always a pleasure. You and I can sit down and we can drink wine. We can and we can drink fun. gin and we can have some fun. <laughs> and uh, are we still on the camera? Thank you, everybody. John, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful mm. wines. Mm. Talking a little bit about how you got here today. Love and kisses. Love and kisses. Love and kisses. Thank you, guys. everybody. Thank you. Remember always Bye. meet your maker. Toot Sweet Social Club. <laughs> Toot Sweet. Tune in every. Tune in. Tune in. Thank you, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Cool. Woo. Cheers, John. Cheers. Ah, oh, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs>